to talk about Hanukkah a little bit. And today, I hope we can dive into the world, word and see, I hope we can see why Hanukkah is significant for Christians, believers in Yeshua, and how, uh, how the day should or the week should have a whole nother meaning completely for followers of Jesus. And in today's message, uh, we've titled it, uh, The Restored Temple in the End Times. And the main theme of Hanukkah, of course, is dedication or rededication or the restoration, if you will. Um, that's what the story ultimately orbits around, the restoration of the place where God dwells and the restoration of the altar, the restoration of the sacrifices, uh, by indirectly or directly, the restoration of the feast days, the holy days of Scripture. Uh, it, it represents the the restoration of the place that fully symbolized and embodied the kissing of heaven and earth and what that should mean to us prophetically moving forward. And I feel, or at least I hope, this message is significant for everyone today um, because what is Hanukkah really about? And you know what? Let's just go straight to the text and let's see what it actually says. So join me in reading uh, uh, out of the first book of Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 59, it says, Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th of the month of Kislev. So we see the celebration of Hanukkah is actually not about a war victory. Um, and it's not necessarily about political independence. It's not about installing a new leadership or a new king. It's not even about God punishing evil oppressors and giving victory to his people. It's about the dedication of the altar, specifically that. That's what everything orbits around. It's about remembering that no matter what, no matter what happens in the world around us, even if something happens where God's presence or his house or the altar where the people of God come and lay their sacrifices to commune with their God in, in an intimate manner, even if that is all taken away or found absent in the world around them, there is always hope and grace from our God. There is always a way to go back. There's always a way to rededicate. God is never too far for this communion to be rekindled. Hence, just as verse 59 says, the Maccabees determined that every year in this season of the month, winter, on the 25th day of the month, it would be a day that was dedicated to the rekindled intimate relationship between man and God, despite how far you come or how far you've gone, despite what the battle did look like. Here, it was a reminder of hope. And if you're unfamiliar with the story of Hanukkah, maybe you've never celebrated it before, or maybe you've never even heard about it before, the story of Hanukkah takes place around 165 BC or BCE, uh, during the time when the Seleucid or the Greek Empire had taken control over Judea. Uh, and the stories, although not necessarily thoroughly fully historical, but the stories in the narrative that we have all the same, uh, they're found in the apocryphal books of the Maccabees. Uh, these books were later added to the Christian canon, the Christian Bible, before the Reformation once again removed them, um, and they can be found today in the Catholic Bible. Uh, I should note that even though these books are considered sacred accounts for Hanukkah in Judaism, they were never part of the Jewish canon. They were never part of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament uh, in its history. Um, like I said, the story takes place with the Greeks coming in and expanding their empire, and they come to Judea, where the Jews live, um, and they, they, they come into the empire, and they begin to introduce their culture, their culture, their Greek lifestyle, even Greek religion to the Judeans. And at the time, many of the Judeans or the Jews embraced it. Uh, it was kind of the cool hipster thing to do during this time. But the thing is, the Greeks did not really appreciate many of the other things that the Judeans held sacred themselves, such as things like circumcision or such things as kosher dietary laws, such things as their faith and obedience to the Torah and the God of Israel. And so the Greeks began to kind of put pressure on the Jews to stop doing these things. And the pressure increased and increased and increased until a battle broke out and an all-out or all -out war broke out. Um, and the Greeks and the Jews fought. 
Um, one of the things that the Greeks did is on the 25th day of the winter month of Kislev, the Hebrew winter month of Kislev, uh, the books tell us that they erected a pagan altar on top of the altar at the temple, God's altar, right there in the courts of the temple, and they sacrificed to a pagan god. Uh, a few verses earlier indicate that it was most likely a pig that was slain on the altar, uh, which, again, the foundation was the actual altar of the temple. And this was a huge abomination. Naturally, this sacred place had become completely defiled, completely desolate. Battle after battle uh, ensued, and the Maccabees, uh, this Judean um, insurgency, if you will, this Judean force, military force that rose up, rebellion, they begin to engage and fight the Greek army, and they begin to actually become victorious, battle after battle, just claim victory over the Greeks, eventually pushing them out of their lands completely. I mean, this is on par with the scene out of Braveheart. I mean, imagine the pushing of the English out of Scotland. And, and all of this happens, and it's this huge celebration. It's like, wow, they fought real hard. And then in chapter 4 of the book of First Maccabees, the people return to the temple and the place is described as being completely desolate. Bushes and shrubs were growing up out of the courts. Uh, there were awful things found in and out of the temple complex. And so what do you do? Well, they grabbed some bleach and they started to scrub. They cleaned the temple inside and out. Um, now, they did have an issue, though. They had an issue with the altar. Uh, so imagine, it, it would have been pretty difficult um, to ignore that a pig was sacrificed on top of the altar of God. Imagine them reintroducing the sacrifices or reintroducing the festivals and the feast days. Imagine them holding Sukkot and then making the sacrifices on the altar. And in the back of their minds, although they're celebrating and they're having fun and they're worshiping, in the back of their minds, they're remembering what the Greeks did on that altar. Because of this, they decided the best thing to do was to grab a big old sledgehammer and knock this altar down, removing all of the stone. And they went out and they collected unhewn stones, as the Torah prescribes, and they rebuilt a brand new altar. And on the same day, the 25th day of Kislev, they dedicated the altar. And when they looked in Scripture on how to rededicate the altar, I mean, imagine these soldiers come back, the people come back, it's been a little while since they've been in the temple, how do we rededicate this new altar? Well, they read in the book of 1 Kings how Solomon, King Solomon, dedicated the very first altar at the temple during the eight-day festival of tabernacles, Sukkot. So in like manner, they too held an eight-day festival of dedication. And that's what the word Hanukkah means. It's the Hebrew word to dedicate or dedication. And that's also why Hanukkah lasts for eight days, because the first time the altar was dedicated, it was during the festival of Sukkot, which is an eight-day feast, right? Now, kind of nerdy fact um, is what did the Maccabees do with the stone of the altar that had the abomination that made it desolate, right? What, what did they do with the altar? They broke down, they tore down, that had pig sacrificed on it. Well, 1 Maccabees 4.46 tells us, it says this, and they laid up the stones in the mountain, the stones of the altar they knocked down, in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. They, they didn't throw the stones away. So strange. Why didn't they throw the stones away? They saved them. They knocked down the altar and they saved the stones that had the abomination sacrificed on them. Why did they do that? Well, the verse says right there, they didn't know what to do with them. Could they have just thrown the stones away? I don't know. They didn't know what to do in this situation. They knew they needed to rebuild it, but what are they supposed to do with the old stones that have this level of holiness to them? You know, it's kind of like when uh, you have a worn out Bible that you've had for years and years and years, and it's falling apart, and you, it's missing pages, and it's just an awful condition. I mean, you don't just throw it away in the trash can, right? Why not? Because there's still a sense of it being sacred. So you're hesitant to simply discard it, even though the reality is what it is, right? I mean, you can't turn the pages. The whole thing's falling apart. It's missing a bunch of pages, crumpled up. It's, it's time for a new Bible. But there's still a sense of reverence there in the sense of holiness. Uh, remember, we spoke about the holiness of the temple way back in Geez, when was it? Was it 2017, I think, we did the, the temple series. And I think we did a, mes a message on Kedusha. It was like the first one or second one in the series. 
But these stones had a high described level of kedusha or holiness on them. They could not simply be discarded onto common ground. So they took the stones and they stored them on the Temple Mount in the holy area. They wouldn't let it leave, right? Until someone should come along and tell them what in the world to do with them because they didn't know what to do. Um, During the time of Yeshua, those stones were still in the temple. They were stored in a room in the temple complex, and they were actually stored, if you want to look it up, they were stored in a chamber called the Lishkat, uh, the Lishkat, the chamber hot, Uh, It was the chamber of tokens. This is where uh, the tokens or seals that were exchanged for money for people to purchase libations such as flour or wine to, to, to go into various offerings. This is where those things were stored. And there was kind of a barrier and there was a back room where these stones were actually stored, if you will. They put them back there and locked the door. What else do you do with them? And, um, and I don't know. I, I, don't re- I don't really know why I find that so neat, but maybe you'll win the next Bible trivia game by holding on to this knowledge. I don't know. Uh, but the point is that it was a very big deal. The altar was rebuilt. It was dedicated. But because of the holiness, the, despite the stones having such a level of defilement in association with what happened, the level of holiness could not be disregarded. So they were stored until someone would one day come along and tell them what to do with them. Um, yeah, and no one really did. Uh, now, this is a story of Hanukkah, and when the world was at its darkest moment, hope and the beautiful grace of God opened up for the opportunity for rededication. In the past few weeks, I think we've been involved with the Misconnection series, and I guess this maybe this kind of is a Misconnection series message, because we're about to jump into John, where we've spent the majority of the series. And we're going to jump into the section of John, John chapter 10, when Hanukkah is mentioned. And what's neat about John is John seems to specifically emphasize and build his narrative, the, the book of John. Uh, he he seems, in, in his account of Yeshua, he seems to specifically build and emphasize three festivals that he believes ultimately are fulfilled to another level and orbit around the mission of Yeshua. And I'll run through these, we'll run through these real quick and we'll read the passages, but they are Passover which is a week-long festival with an extra day, first roots at the end, eight days. We have the Festival of Tabernacles, Sukkot, which is a week-long festival with an eighth day added at the end, eight days. And we have Hanukkah mentioned, an eight-day festival. Three eight-day festivals that John is emphasizing having something to do with Yeshua. Uh, Some scholars have suggested that since eight is a type of number of infinity or eternity, it's the number outside of seven, if you will, um, that John is making that connection here. I don't know. Maybe. I think it's kind of neat. Uh, but here we go. So John chapter 6 frames out the first connection of Passover in connection with Jesus. And John chapter 6, verse 3, starting in verse 3, here we go. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. And what happens next? All right. You have this huge crowd of people that just appears in the story and is hungry for bread, just like the first Passover story, just like the first Exodus story. And here Yeshua brings forth the miracle and feeds everyone with bread and fish, right? Verse 31, it even even emphasizes this in the text. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Love that. So, We have John associating Yeshua with being the bread that brings forth life, inaugurating this new type of new Passover with this greater exodus, this greater Passover, right? And you also have John associating Yeshua uh, in the next chapter with the Feast of Tabernacles, the next eight-day feast, uh, starting in John chapter 7, verse 11. Now, Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Right? So here we go. John is intentionally drawing your attention to the festival. John is structuring his account of Yeshua a certain way. So we can expect him to link Yeshua to Sukkot in some way during this chapter. Um, majority of the chapter is, of course, about who Yeshua is. 
and we know about the debate between the religious leaders and him that breaks out. Um, and here is what happens in verse 37. On the last great day, or the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. And here, on hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet, or the prophet that's greater and prophesied to be greater than Moses. Others said he is the Messiah, the King, right? So what's interesting here is, is during Sukkot, we know that there was a water libation, a water pouring ceremony that took place at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's inferred here that Yeshua is focusing on himself using the same types of keywords in the language that are associated with the water pouring ceremony at Sukkot, this grand spectacle, right? And here, Yeshua is saying that, no, I am the one who quenches the thirst within, right? And so each day of the seven-day feast began with a water-drawing ritual, which was the great time of rejoicing over God's provision of the water for the crops that year. Uh, this is the time of year when the early rains begin. It was the agricultural new year, the reset. So you plant your seed, you plant your crops, and you wait for God to send the blessing of the rain, water. Um, but every day during the feast, a priest would take a golden pitcher and lead a musical processional to the Pool of Siloam, where he plunged the pitcher into the waters while reciting uh, Isaiah 12.3. Therefore, with joy, you shall draw water from the wells of salvation. Right? Uh, Jerusalem's sole water supply was from this pool and the Gihon Spring that feeds it. Therefore, water was kind of precious and very valuable. It was a blessing, Right? Yet the priest returned to the temple with this golden pitcher of water, and he began to pour it over the altar while reciting Psalm 118, uh, which says, Hosanna, I pray, O Lord, send now your blessing or prosperity. The pouring of the water symbolized the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, right? And it was followed by a great silence that descended on the sanctuary as the people reflected upon God's mercy and grace. Um, his blessing and his spirit, the true refreshment. This ritual took place every day, but on the seventh day, it took on an intensity filled with excitement and anticipation. And John's telling us that it was on that day that Yeshua stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. In this context, it was clear that the people that he was inviting, like, he was inviting them to come and accept him as the one who would give them the living waters of salvation, just as he mentions in John 4. And so it's just neat to see all these connections. And so John associate like, he's associating Yeshua with the ultimate fulfillment of Passover in John 6, and he's associating Yeshua with the ultimate fulfillment of the greater Passover and the greater Exodus. And now here in John 7, he's associating Yeshua with the ultimate fulfillment of the greater meaning behind the Feast of Tabernacles, when God tabernacles among us and his spirit is fully let loose in our lives. That the blessing of the rain is great and truly a sign of God's graciousness and salvation to his people. Then here standing before us is the ultimate fulfillment of God's graciousness and salvation poured out for his people. And it's not the water that the priest is pouring out. It's Yeshua, right? He is the ultimate fulfillment of everything Sukkot is meant to be about. Now, there's some debate, and this is interesting, there's some debate in scholarship on how long the chronology lasts in John in the setting of Sukkot, and when exactly does it switch to Hanukkah, okay? Um, in other words, are chapters 8 of John and chapters 9 of John, do they have to do with Sukkot, or do they have to do with Hanukkah? And it's actually a, a it's, it's not as one-sided as you would think. It's very interesting. But we know that Hanukkah is mentioned in John chapter 10. So let's just go ahead and read this. Is John chapter 10, uh, verse 22. It says, Then came the festival of dedications, Hanukkah, at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, if you are the King, tell us plainly. Right? And... Of course, the context here is once again, 
Who is the fullness of this person of Jesus? I mean, that's what everybody's been contending with in John. And how does Yeshua answer this request for him to tell just them uh, if, if he is the Messiah or not? Like, how does he answer their question? We're in verse 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Wow. Now, for those of you who are nerdy about the text, the obvious shift from what took place a few months earlier at Sukkot in John chapter 7, and Hanukkah in the winter is right there in verse 22. That's where it is actually announced in the text that it's Hanukkah. However, notice the language that Yeshua is using in verses 26 and 27. He's using the same language that he used at the beginning of chapter 10, speaking about the sheep and the good shepherd and, the, and giving the sheep everything that they need, right? And so this is one of the contributions that makes some scholars believe that the section of content that is actually orbiting Uh, around the festival of Hanukkah doesn't simply start at verse 22, but at minimum is contained within the whole chapter 10 of John. And there's even some arguments that are actually really good uh, when they point out what's going on in the Greek, that chapter 9 is also not necessarily orbiting around the festival of tabernacles, but also orbiting around Hanukkah. Regardless, doesn't really matter. Uh, Why is this significant? Why is it significant that Yeshua is in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, and not only that, standing in the courts. I mean, it's right here. It's right here that he claims to be the giver of true life, eternal life. Not only that, it's right here where he claims that he is the shepherd, the good shepherd that God gives all of the flock over to him who has authority. Not only that, he goes on to claim that him and the Father are one. That phrase alone on top of him declaring himself to be the good shepherd, which was associated already or attributed to Yahweh himself in Ezekiel 34, it triggers the Jewish leadership in the area. And so what do do the Jewish uh, opponents of him that were just arguing with him early in the chapter, what do they do? Verse 31, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. Naturally. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God, right? Could it be, if John was intentionally associating Yeshua with Passover to point out the greater fulfillment of Passover that can only be found in Yeshua, could it be, if John was also intentionally associating Yeshua with Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, to show the greater fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles that can only be found in Yeshua, that also John is doing the same thing again with Hanukkah. That on the day that is celebrating the holiness and grace of God found in the rededication and the restoration of the altar and the temple, that John is pointing out the greater fulfillment of the rededication of the temple, the restoration of the place where God and man meet, the meeting place between heaven and earth, that this place is only truly found in Yeshua. So look at where John says Yeshua is. Where does it say? In Solomon's colonnade. He's in the courts, right? The outer courts. He's in the temple complex. Yeshua here is standing at the very place that the Greeks trampled on, where the Greeks spilt the blood of swine before God's presence. He is standing at the place where the abomination took place. He's standing at the place where the new altar was built and rededicated. And now he's standing there as the good shepherd, as the king, as the image of God in the midst of all of Israel. He is the place where heaven meets earth. He is the place where people meet God. Now, what else does John say about Yeshua in regards to the temple? Well, remember back in John chapter 2, 19, it says something very interesting. John writes this. He says, Jesus answered them, destroy the temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had been speaking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. 
Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. John seems to just break through the fourth wall of his own narrative of Yeshua here. Um, He says, like, he wants to let you know that Yeshua not only said this about the temple, but he wants to go back and give his commentary to you personally, outside of the story, outside of when this happened, to let you know what he really meant, that he himself is the true fulfillment of everything the temple was, that through his ministry, his death, his burial for three days, and his resurrection, there was a restoration of the true temple of God. It was the temple that was always meant to exist. It was the place where God's holiness and intimacy and graciousness and love and justice would overflow out of. It wasn't made of bricks. It wasn't made of animal skins and poles. It wasn't carried on the backs of priests and location and location traveled all around. No, it was exalted up on the cross. And there there are some people that actually have a problem with that concept, but I think it's one of the oldest and amazing and awesome things about Yeshua that the New Testament authors absolutely specifically proclaim. Here's what Matthew records. Uh, He records this uh, uh, when he was debating the Pharisees about the Sabbath in Matthew chapter 12, verse 6. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Like He just says it. As believers, we cannot help but to see Jesus as the fulfillment of of the Hanukkah story the true restored temple. Guys, when we celebrate Hanukkah, we have a bigger celebration. For us, when we celebrate the Festival of Lights, what we're really celebrating is we're really celebrating the Festival of the Light. And we're reminded of the hope that that is shown to us. And we're reminded of the hope that is only found in Yeshua. So how does the Gospel of Matthew end? Right? How does it end? It ends with the Great Commission, right? The last order from Yeshua to his followers. And what does he say? Let's review it, starting in Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's read that again. All authority in all of heaven and in all of earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The order is to go. The order is to overtake the earth. The order is to be fruitful and multiply. It's a Genesis 1 language, or it's Genesis 1 mandate, I should say. Uh, Yeshua reminds them that he has all authority. Not 99% of authority, 100% of authority in the universe is found in him. Not just on earth. Jesus has 100% authority in heaven as well. And he uses this to motivate his next sentence, the Great Commission. Therefore, because I have all authority, because I am the true light of God, because I have all authority in heaven and earth, You as my disciples are going to go as all nations with my authority, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And we touched on this recently. What did Jesus command us to do? Some would say he commanded us to keep Torah. Yes, he absolutely did. That's absolutely true. But how do you keep Torah? And Yeshua leaves us. Answering that question, Yeshua leaves us with this self-sacrificial mandate of love, this mandate that says that no matter how persecuted you are, no matter how badly someone hates you, no, no matter how badly someone hurts you, no matter how unfair it is, you respond with the type of love of God to the degree that Yeshua gave it. And the very last thing that Matthew says in his account is, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in one sense, we're waiting for Yeshua to return um, any moment, right? This climactic vision of this grand returning. But in another sense, Yeshua is here now. He's with you now, is what he said. And not only that, 
he has commissioned you to be his representative on earth, which means that when you show the love of Yeshua to other people, the fullness of the power of Yeshua is manifest into their world. When you show the love of Yeshua to the world, the world doesn't see you as much as it sees Jesus. At least that's what it's supposed to be. And I know it seems like, like kind of going out into left field here, but this is the impact of the gospel. That no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in your reality, in the world around you, with the people around you, no matter we respond the way that Yeshua did. I was reading a book, uh, rereading a book by uh, N.T. Wright the day the revolution began, and he, he talks a lot about uh, the story of Hannah and her seven sons. It's a Hanukkah story. It's not a great one. Uh, you guys, if you've ever read Maccabees, Second Maccabees, you know it. It's from Second Maccabees chapter 7, and it, it's this account of Antiochus brutally, and that's an understatement. It, it, it like, the whole chapter is extremely uncomfortable because of how detailed and gory it is. But he brutally kills and tortures seven brothers in front of their mother. Each time he attempts to get them to throw off the label of being a devoted Jew to God and eat some pork. And of course, every one of them does not. But it's interesting because throughout the chapter, you see all these little insults to Antiochus. And then the last son, the last son has this epic speech where he, he tells Antiochus that he explains to Antiochus, why all of these bad things are happening to, happening to the Judeans, why they're being tormented by the Greeks, why these things are happening to his own brothers right now by Antiochus. And he tells Antiochus that all of this is happening to them, all of the torture and oppression from the Greeks is happening to them because God is punishing them for their sins. It's an interesting point in the chapter. God is punishing us for our sins. You are the vessel or the tool that God is using to torment and punish us for our sins. Um, and, and, and then he throws a whole bunch of insults at Antiochus. And then he says, and this is a kicker. I, this, is, this is the kicker. Then he tells Antiochus, he says, and you know what? God is going to forgive us of our sins. But then he looks back at Antiochus and he says, but God is never going to forgive you of yours. Hmm. And this is, and this traditionally, and I'm totally guilty of preaching a sermon on this chapter of Second Maccabees. This is traditionally looked at as a chapter that, uh, that lifts up and exalts resilience and standing up to evil and not being swayed by the pressures of the world, even unto death, to be loyal to God, even unto death, right? And as I was rereading this the other day, this story, I noticed something that made me extremely uncomfortable. This story is not a model for how Christians are to respond to persecution and martyrdom. Matt, how can you possibly say that? Because Yeshua left us a very uncomfortable example to follow. And it wasn't hurling insults towards our enemies that were persecuting us. And it wasn't looking at our enemies with such arrogance to say that God's going to forgive us of our sins, but God will never forgive them of theirs. No. The uncomfortable and the irritating example that Yeshua left us to follow took place on the cross, where his skin was filleted open, completely naked, vulnerable, bone showing, the saliva and the snot of his enemies dripping from his own face. And he looks at them, and he asks God to forgive them. He doesn't even ask that they would have humility and repent. He acknowledges that they are clueless on everything that they're doing. He simply asks, God, forgive them. He wants their sins forgiven. And do you know why he wants this? Well, because in Matthew chapter 5, he tells us to forgive our enemies. And do you remember why Yeshua tells us to forgive our enemies? It's a big point. So we will be children of our Father. He tells us to forgive our enemies because that is how God loves. Guys, there's a lot of things about the way some people celebrate Hanukkah that I don't necessarily agree with. And that's okay. You do your own thing. Um, but for me, like, I don't necessarily agree with celebrating the military victory of the Maccabees. 
because I don't think that's what actually the celebration is about. Um, I mean, if you look later in the history, even in the first century, I doubt the Pharisees were celebrating the military victory that led to the air oppression by the Hasmoneans. Like, that doesn't make sense. That and the fact that the Maccabees like, evolved, the Hasmoneans in the next generation became more oppressive than the Greeks were to their own people. Uh, so much so that the people actually called the Greeks back to help them fight the new Hasmonean dynasty that had taken up their place as kings over the people. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> it's not a, fair, a fairy tale ending uh, at all. Um, no, that's, that's not a great thing to celebrate. No, but I do see the hope of the dedication. I mean, that, that's the central theme of the Hanukkah story, and that's exactly what First Maccabees says. Um, I mean, it's in the name. It's in the name, Hanukkah, dedication. And I'm reminded of that ultimate fulfillment of rededication, of restoration, of hope and mercy that's found in Yeshua. And in the gospel accounts, the New Testament authors make it clear that Yeshua is the ultimate fulfillment of everything the temple was supposed to be. But what's incredible, what's incredible, Matt, Yeshua, Yeshua is the temple, we get it. What's incredible is after Yeshua sends his followers out to fulfill their mandate, you, the New Testament begins using the same label that is used for Jesus on his followers, right? Remember what, what John says here in 1 Corinthians 3.16? Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are God's temple, right? What about 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians 6? Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. What about 1 Peter 2, 5? You also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you, as a follower, as an imitator, as an ambassador of the greater temple, Yeshua, to the temple, the place where heaven meets earth, the place where God's presence, God's love, God's justice, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness overflows into the world around it. That's, that's what the New Testament describes you as, as a follower. You know, one of my favorite prophetic visions is in Zechariah chapter 2, and it speaks about an angel giving this vision of the future new Jerusalem. Um, and it's a little bit different than the one that's uh, in Revelation. Revelation has a, t- a new Jerusalem that has walls around it and 12 gates, but the gates are always open, right? So everybody can come and go, um, if you will. And, and And in Zechariah, it's a little bit different, but it's this new Jerusalem, this place of God's dwelling. And it says that this new Jerusalem will be a city without walls. And the reason why it will not have any walls is because it's going to consume so many people, all nations, if you will, and all the animals, all of creation. Uh, As if to say, it's going to expand to overtake the world. The place of God's presence is going to expand across all nations, across the entire earth. And it says that Yahweh's glory will permeate permeate within it. And it's a really neat vision. I love it. And I, I like to think, and it's debatable, that's fine. Everyone has their opinions. Here's mine. I like to think that the vision, that vision in Zechariah 2, is coming true today, right now right now. I like to think that when Yeshua told his disciples to go to all nations and multiply, I like to think that that this is the kingdom of God expanding across the globe. I like to think that the temple of God is overtaking the world every single time a disciple fully embraces the mandate to imitate Christ. And so what does the restored or rededicated or ultimate fulfillment of the temple look like in the end times? Well, It looks like the people of God giving their full allegiance to Yeshua, no matter how irritating or how uncomfortable or how unfair or how painful it is. And I see both in what I see in observing others, but also in what I see observing myself, because I too am a human. um, I found that sometimes, sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking that we're at a place with God that we're really not. Sometimes we get distracted And if that alone is not an amen-worthy moment, I don't know what is, (laughs) because that's true. We get distracted with so much stuff in the world, which I can only chalk up 
to it as like the plans of the devil to stop the kingdom mandate expanding through the lives of those who claim to follow Yeshua. Like we get distracted with judging other people. Anybody? We get so caught up in what everyone else is doing that it distracts us even from our own life and where we need to be with God. It's truth. We get distracted with judging other people instead of loving other people. We get distracted by what the billboards of the televisions tell us. We get distracted with the weight of the unexpected things that happen in our lives. Sometimes we just get distracted because of sin in our lives. Sometimes our routine is stripped from us, and we are so vain to think that our comfort is more important than building loving relationships in the name of Yeshua. Guys, it's been a hard year for most people. It's been a hard year for a lot of people who have lost their jobs. It's been a hard year for a lot of people who may be losing their homes in the coming months. It's been a hard year for marriages. Maybe, maybe as a married married couple, you have not had to work out how to spend this much time together for a long time. It's been a hard year for families. It's been a hard year for those of us who have lost people. But just like in the story of the Maccabees, the beautiful grace of God endures. And during this season, we're reminded of what it takes and what it looks like to rededicate something that belongs to God. For one, sometimes it takes a sledgehammer to destroy the old altar so that a new one can be built up to be sanctified before God, for God to use. You are that place that God wants to make his abode. You are that place that God wants to work in. You are that place that God wants to work through. But you might need to take a look at your life and rededicate it back to God. See, the thing about our God is our God is a God of new beginnings. But the biggest problem that I see in myself and in each other is sometimes we like to distract ourselves and pretend that we don't need a rededication, but we don't need another new beginning. Like we have, we, we've somehow went through this life unscathed. In the season of Hanukkah, we have this reminder that we can pretend all we want, but the reality is the reality. And so I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're at a place where you realize you're pretending. Maybe you're at a place where you realize you can be carrying something around you need to give to God fully. Maybe you're at a place where you need to grab a sledgehammer and knock those stones down so that something can be rebuilt back up for God to use. Guys, God can only meet you where you are, not where you're pretending to be. This is what the Hanukkah story teaches us. It's the same thing that Yeshua teaches us. Guys, I'd like to end here with a quote by scholar Victor J. Donovan in his article, uh, essay, titled Hanukkah and the Birth of Christ. And, uh, and just, I thought these word, words were so appropriate for this time uh, that we have this reminder of what rededication actually means in light of who we know is our king, and that is Yeshua. And so here it is. It says this, Let us use these thoughts, therefore, on the Hanukkah of old, in order to make our Advent a truly messianic one, leading up to God's birth among men. Then will be fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. To them that dwell in the region of the shadow of death, light is risen. People will see the great light, Jesus Christ, shining in our lives. In Him, through Him, and with Him, shall all of the lights of Hanukkah burst forth in all their prophetic brilliance upon a crib, upon a cross, and upon a crown of glory. Does the world around you feel the intimacy of God's temple shining into their lives? Because that is your mandate as the temple as the light bearer. And so during this festival of lights, during this festival of lights, we're reminded of the true light that should always be shining through us. Is there something in your life that's hindering that light to fully shine through? Because now is the appropriate season for rededication. Alvina Marcano, our Father, our King Father, we thank you for this time that we can dive into your word and see how everything and the Torah and the prophets 
And even the stories of Israel outside of Scripture point to one thing and one thing only, the power, the strength, and the kingship of Yeshua, the Messiah. We ask, Father, that you would use us, that you would remind us, and Father, that also that you would prick our hearts today of the things in our life that need to be rededicated back to you and maybe the things that need to be knocked down first so that the light of Yeshua can fully shine through us and that your temple can be seen and your temple can be felt in the end times. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen.